Okie doke. Uh, Gregory Braille. In here. Phil Burton. He's here, muted. He's here. <laughs> Tony Carrasco. I don't see him. Not yet. In Yang Cho. I don't see her either. Not yet. Larry Klein. Here. Nadia Nayak. Here. Keith Rechdahl. Here. David Shen. Here. Carrie Templeton. Here. Okay, great. Awesome. So we'll take the first five minutes for any staff updates. Um, staff, take it away. Um, if I can, I think actually. Oh, Philip, you muted yourself. Goodness, I was shouting too. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. I think the items that we have to list are um, related to the item. So, um, if you would prefer, we could share, you know, the information that we have under the um, item. Okay. Um, unless Ripon, do we have anything else to share? I don't know that we do. Oh, town I hall think, stuff. Uh, all the uh, we don't have the final report okay. yet, unfortunately. Um, okay. I guess the one thing we can share is we met with um, Safe Routes to School, um, what's it called, safety reps, tran uh, transportation safety reps, TSRs last week, and gave them a presentation and overview of um, the different alternatives and uh, you know where we're at in the process, and um, you know talked through um, bike ped and um, the suggested um, Safe Routes to School that group did they have any feedback are we going to get to hear that feedback are they going to write something or are you going to write a report i i'm not sure that we'll be writing a report but we can summarize um what we um got as far as feedback from that meeting um there was not like a specific um alternative you know suggestion or recommendation from any of them there are just some questions about um certain things i believe i don't know ripon do you want to share anything about that yeah, mo most of the questions were how are these, uh, you know, uh, routes handled and how we are addressing that. And so by showing them the different plans and how they were maneuvering, they were satisfied with those answers. And um, some of their questions were pertaining to the traffic control devices that may be needed, which would be, which we indicated that would be in the future phases. Um, so yeah, they they said um, yeah, we we are we definitely requested them to see if uh, you have any feedback or comments they can share with us, or if they have any more questions, they can send us those questions, and we'll be uh, able to help them answer them or further look into it and uh, provide them feedback. And if we do receive anything, suggestions or improvements or uh, you know things that we that was would be relevant to a feedback or a comment to our existing designs we will share with XCAP uh, so that they can at least include it in the report if they have, you know, or, or address it accordingly. Yeah, I guess, okay. I guess I'll say the reason I was quick to say, I'm not really sure. I, I think it was more like, can you explain how this works um, as we're going through the different alternatives really? And can you okay. explain, you know, how this, you know, this certain area works? It was, it was not really, um, it was an opportunity for them to really understand the alternatives and ask the questions they needed to understand them. Um, having, you know, some of them having interacted with the virtual town hall, some of them not. Um, so yeah, that was really what it was more so. And then following up on that, an opportunity for them to um, give us their feedback. Um, yeah. So I think understanding and what- One of the feedback- so, Go ahead. Sorry, you can go ahead, uh, Nadi. Uh, I was just going to sure. say, I, I think it'd be interesting to understand where more of their questions are, because it, um, for me, I'm, I'm assuming these are folks who are used to kind of looking at these types of drawings. So if they have question, repeated questions on a particular area, that to me signals that there's either something missing in our drawings or we need some additional labels or kind of like where do folks get stuck in understanding those designs. Um, so if you happen to notice any pattern around that, that would be helpful because then when we think about, you know, we might need one more drawing that shows whatever this connection, um, that that might be, you know, it might just help us understand where people get stuck. Yeah, I'll see what we have that we can share with you. Great. We have maybe a, doc, a little bit of a documentation. We had an issue. We were hoping to record the thing and unfortunately that didn't work. Okay. okay. Ripon, you were going to say something? 
Yeah, what I was uh, one of the feedback I think was related to the uh, width of the tunnel. So they were saying that if we could, you know, accommodate for the wider, which is already in your uh, recommendation, was kind of uh, question or feedback from them. And was that the tunnel related to Churchill to the to the underpass options? Which tunnels? Uh, Churchill. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I did want to ask, I know that uh, I saw that, that there was a, on the consent calendar, there was some uh, one section 130 money, which is grade separation money that the city had received previously. And so there was it related to upgrades around Churchill and the report mentioned that there were some improvements that were taken out, but it didn't explain what was removed. Could you maybe talk about that just a little bit, if you know, so that folks have been following this can understand what was taken out. It looked like the, um, they kept in a lot of the safety improvements. And I think I understood from talking to a member of the public who I think spoke to Philip is that there was a two-way bike plan part that was taken out. But could you explain that in more detail for folks that are following along? I don't know, Rippon might have the real details on this, but yeah, the, the, main, the main part of that plan involved, well, the main part of the plan that was removed um, from the grant would have required us to remove um, parking from in front of homes um, on Churchill uh, between Alma and Emerson um, and install a, a two-way cycle track. And uh, we would have needed to do that in the next year. And um, I think it's um, it's pretty unlikely. And because this is a, a grant fund that needed, the grant funds needed to be expended this year. Um, so I think it's very unlikely that we would have been able to get through the uh, process of um, getting neighbors to agree that they would give up their parking in front of their houses um, during this year. So that's the primary uh, basis for um, the, the change to the, um, the, the amendment or the amendment of that um, grant funding. Um, the, um, the project does provide, um, so there's a little bit of confusion, I think about whether the project was being modified um, in relation to the, um, the grade separation project. And I'd say that's a little bit um, incorrect because this project's happening despite the fact that we have grade separation in recognition that we can get benefits from the safety improvements that are coming from this um, Section 130 project in the meantime right. until we do whatever we're going to do um, with the grade separation. So it's things like pre-signal and some other safety features um, that will provide benefit until the time when this um, intersection becomes grade separated. Does it include adding that extra right turn um, between uh, on, uh, let's see, westbound Churchill making a right onto northbound El Camino? There's that pork chop that's there, right? In front of 25 Churchill. So if you're, if you're coming from Old Palo Alto and you're headed towards Stanford and you get to El Camino, there's a moment where cars can go right, but they're supposed to make some improvements there so that there's more space on the pork chop. And I think they're adding a right turn lane there. Yeah, I don't know that offhand. Ripon, do you know that offhand? I don't remember that. Uh, off, uh, you know, okay, no worries. I just wanted to see if that, there was anything else on that. I, I, I'm sorry to say, I don't remember if that was in the original plan or the modified plan. Okay, all right. Um, and I think Sarah wanted to say, we've been having some email trouble, that, and Sarah was going to just speak a little bit about her discussions with IT about that. So, right. So I, I did get the message that um, a community member had gotten an auto reply when they sent an email to the XCAP email address, the address that's XCAP at city of Palo Alto org. The message said something, uh, the auto reply said that the mailbox was quarantined. Um, so <laughs> I don't know what's up with that. My apologies. 2020. I did, <laughs> yeah. I forwarded it to um, IT and I did successfully get about 45 or 50 emails in that inbox this past week. So um, I know it's working for most people, hopefully. So we'll figure out what that is and get back to that community member. Thank you. And I did want to encourage the XCAPers. I had written a rule in my email to make sure anything that was addressed to XCAP was supposed to be going right into my inbox. And I still had maybe 35 messages in my spam folder. So I just want to encourage XCAPers to just go in and look in there because I was Really, I have Gmail, and I was very surprised by the number of things that somehow still got rerouted to spam. Despite yeah, I, I, I check my spam pretty much every day, um, okay. and there's stuff in there from XCAP. Well, you have healthy email habits, Greg. I <laughs> well, I only check that spam every. No, I, I never used to check my spam, but I do for <laughs> I do because I care about XCAP. 
Great. Well, thank you. Um, okay. Anybody else have any questions for staff other than what we're going to hear on the alternatives? No. Okay. Um, okay. That moves us to item number three, which is oral communications. So again, if you're a member of the public who wants to speak on this item, and uh, this is for an item not on the agenda, now would be a good time to raise your hand and uh, each speaker can have two minutes. And I will turn it over to Elizabeth is helping me with the speakers and Joanna is helping me to the timers, to do the timer. So, uh, and, and uh, anticipated thank you for your assistance and you guys can take it away. Okay. Um, one raised hand, um, this is Drew. Uh, Drew, go ahead and unmute yourself and you may start speaking. Hello. Um, going to just speak for a moment on the four tracks over many meetings. Occasionally this comes up and last meeting it did again. And while uh, you all are very aware of the high speed rail versus Caltrain thing on four tracks and kind of pointing fingers at each other and whether high speed rail comes, I just wanted to point out that uh, for my, I've been following this stuff for a couple of years that the high growth plan for Caltrain in many ways will also potentially require passing tracks even if there is no high speed rail because of two conflicting priorities. One, a, a clock face scheduling, which imposes a certain uh, just discipline to the timing of trains versus express trains and they gotta be able to pass each other. So that that's regardless of um, high speed rail coming or not at some point there's just so much demand and there's not enough capacity and so that's what the passing tracks and then the other two pieces that are, are indirectly but also impact is talk of a second transbay tunnel uh, up between san francisco and oakland and that tunnel would also include um, the same track gauge as caltrain and so there could be trains coming from the east bay or sacramento and I understand all the electrification and all those other issues. So, but long term, you know, 30, 40, 50 years from now, and they could come down the peninsula. So that's not a high speed rail thing. And this isn't about anything's going to happen anytime in the next 20, 30, might be 40 years from now. But just I think it is a good thing for just vaguely keeping in, in concept that there could be some kind of four track thing um, just because of these other things that aren't related to high speed rail. And that's all. It's not immediate, not anything, but, and there's also the Dumbarton rail bridge and stuff. So there's just some other things out there and stuff, but thank you all for all your work. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. Uh, we have two raised hands currently. Uh, the next speaker is Carrie Wagner, followed by Kathy Jordan. Carrie, uh, please unmute yourself. You may begin to speak. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you for your work, X cappers on all of this. I would like to, regardless of the, of the type of grade separation we have, I would really like to have some kind of separated bike and pedestrian crossing over by, in South Palo Alto, over by Loma Verde. Um, I think that would be really, really help mitigate a lot of our issues with massive amounts of bikes at Charleston and at Meadow. Um, it would also be a good way to get new housing in North Ventura to move, to be able to get to Midtown and Midtown people to be able to get to El Camino. I think for a lot of reasons, it's really needed. And, you know, I don't know, it, it could be an underpass, it could be an overpass regardless, but um, thank you so much for your work on this. Thank you very much, Carrie. Uh, our next speaker is Kathy Jordan. Kathy, you can go in ahead and unmute yourself and begin to speak. Just thank you very much. And thank you to all the XCAP for their uh, long and hard work. Um, I wanted to add uh, a few data points. Um, I had read that um, someone had said that there's no question that um, circumstances will return to a pre-COVID situation. And so I wanted to um, add a few data points that um, that would be relevant to that, as well as to ask the XCAP uh, to consider that uh, any recommendation um, would need to have an asterisk essentially next to it, since again, assumptions have changed, underlying assumptions have changed. Uh, 
Maybe you all read that the MTC has now added to its plan Bay Area that it plans to mandate um, a certain percentage of remote work telecommuting for companies of 25 employees or over. That's an interesting data point to add to, again, the, the number of companies that now are permitting continued 100% remote work, Atlassian, Twitter, Facebook, Shopify, Square, as well as the other companies that are permitting remote work on an extended basis, Google, Amazon, et cetera, Siemens, others. Um, you may have also noted that 30 Bay Area cities, according to the Mercury News in May, 30 Bay Area cities lost population in the last year. Um, and as well, um, at Pinterest, as a result of remote work, uh, decided to pay um, an $89 million lease termination fee to avoid having to lease another uh, set of office space in San Francisco. According to Gartner, 80% of company leaders will permit part-time re remote work. 47% will permit 100% remote work. So just some data points to add to your consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathy. Um, I believe that is last raised hand. Great. Thank you to all the public speakers. We appreciate you turning out week after week. Um, okay, that moves us to Item number four, which is our XCAP member updates and working group updates. Um, this is uh, XCAP is you should have a final report chapter tracker and a feedback tracker. Um, we got a couple of persons, people's feedback. That's awesome. I did want to point out at the bottom of our agenda where we have tentative X come, upcoming XCAP meetings, um, we're throwing down uh, the gauntlet here a little bit. So on October 21st, we're going to try to do consideration of our final report. So that means if you have edits to the chapters that have been turned in thus far, um, we really, really need you to get those in. So um, again, by tomorrow at, uh, I think 10 a.m. is the time that Sarah would like them by. Um, that would be super helpful because we really do need to get everybody's edits in there. Uh, and I'd be surprised if nobody has edits. So um, this is kind of when we get to the uh, intense period here. So if you guys could turn those in, that would be awesome. Does anybody have any questions on the chapters they're working on or comments or? I, I always have questions. Um, sure, great. On chapters where we have incoming feedback, is it now our responsibility to incorporate and then send another draft? Um, well, if you, Larry, what are your what are your thoughts on this? I'm 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 punting to I'm Larry. I'm happy because, to do that. I want to know like if someone else is going to do that or should I do that? Well, what I'm thinking, what I'm also thinking is if you only got one person's feedback, it's one thing. But if you got eight other people's feedback, then that becomes a thing, right? So, um, and I, I'm looking at Larry because he's had more experience doing these group projects than I have, <laughs> so. Greg, I, I think that you want to respond just so that uh, uh, if you really disagree with some particular uh, proposed revision that we know about it, it, it uh, maybe it's just a matter of grammar, but it may also be something that's substantive. So you as the initial author, I think would be uh, uh, that you should uh, respond. So, so what I can do is I can, I can accept the changes and send a new draft. Right. And then I also have a little bit of a small philosophical question. Many of Phil's comments on my chapter were about where were the references. And I think that leads to a question of reference format because there are actually a ton of references in that doc. Mm -hmm. are, are we gonna footnote every reference or how, how do you wanna handle that? I think um, I, my thought was we'd put a footnote but that it, do, it doesn't footnote to the bottom of the page but footnotes instead to an appendix at the end. Okay, so I'll, so so I'll just I'll just figure out a way to do that. And then, Larry, do, does that sound okay to you? Because I know Larry and I were saying, you know, you don't want to go through a document where you have only like three paragraphs of text and then forty-seven footnotes, because that could very well be your kind of document, right? Um, so, Larry, does a footnote for the appendix sound good? Yes, I think we I thought we previously agreed to that. Yeah. Okay. okay, just okay. I think you uh, and I had, but. Okay, so, uh, Nadia. Yeah. Between now and Friday, I am hoping to have a final draft out of chapter four. Okay. But, but uh, the format that Megan created and I have been following is footnotes page by page. Uh, I honestly don't know if I'll have the time between now and Friday to also put the footnotes in the pens. I'll see if I can. It may, may not be easy in word. I just don't know yet. 
Okay, I don't honestly know if it's a cut and paste or if not, but I mean, I think for now it's a draft. We can figure out how to move those afterwards. All right. Okay. Maybe so we have some word guru I, among us. I imagine there. Microsoft Word's got some way to handle this. Uh, yeah. um, I imagine too, but I've just never done it. And so I don't either. It's it's the difference between footnotes and endnotes. All right, well, if it's that easy, then I'll do it. But if it's not that easy, I, I, I'd like to beg okay. uh, for leave to leave things in their current format. Okay. Uh, the other question which Greg raised and uh, is, do we adopt a common style of citations or do we each use our own style? Um, I don't know if you meant to raise that point, Greg, but it logically follows. Well, no, I mean, I think that that's an excellent question. Um, so uh, that, that, of course, may or may not force a whole lot more work. Uh, because this is not actually a documentation manager. Yeah, so in my experience, just as someone who has spent way too much time in the footnotes, um, what I prefer in footnotes personally is that when there's a, uh, like a web page link that the web page is written out and not just linked to, because eventually this gets printed in some format where those links get broken. And so when you write out, this is on page, you know, www.whatever, gfx, whatever, people can actually go find it again versus when it's a link and eventually that gets cut. And so um, to the extent that there's, you know, uh, links to web pages, I think those have to be written out long form in the appendix because it's the only way to kind of keep them for as long as possible. Also helps if you have to use the Wayback Machine, another place I've spent way too much time. Yeah, now it may be that we defer until later on the whole issue of a common formatting style, but it. Um... Yeah, I'd say if we get if we get to the point where we want to argue about the format of the appendix, we're doing. Then we're really in trouble. Well, yeah. well no, oh, that then we're, we're doing, in trouble. That we've actually passed the other bulk of the stuff, which seems much harder. So I'm not I'm not too worried that All there's right. going to be significant right. stylistic difference in the appendix. But I again I will say I, I'd prefer that people write out the links to everything so that it's just yeah. so don't get broken. Yeah, and I've spent way too much time on formatting uh, footnote styles and several lifetimes worth. <laughs> Okay. Anybody it's else? not fun. Greg, did you have another question? One of the things that's in the report, Phil marked as, you know, hey, what's the source of this? Um, it was something that came in Pat's original report. And Pat's actually a bit of an expert on safety. So um, we can ask Pat if she also, has a source yeah. for stuff. Yeah, or I might just say in a footnote, you know, former XCAP member, Pat Lau, member of the whatever, whatever, whatever said. Yeah, or we can, uh, if we need to ask Pat if she has a source for that, we can, okay, I, I think yeah. she's reachable still. She said she'd be happy to, you know, if she checks and moved to I will Chicago, email yeah. I think. Okay. But, um, but she's willing to help. Same with Megan, Phil, if you have any questions or there's anything in Megan's work that needed a, a citation, um, I, I think Megan would be amenable to try to help. In any oh, she, she, she has been very willing to offer help, but so far I've managed not to bother her. Great, yeah. She's doing hard work in Washington. <laughs> so, um, okay, anybody else? Keith, I can't see you, but if you've got a question, interrupt. <laughs> I've got nothing. Okay. All right. Looks like we don't have anything else. So I think with that, we can move to item number five. So item number five is a continuation of deliberations on Meadow and Charleston. Um, this is part of a continuing meeting. So we have taken public comment on this item if you have not previously spoken to this agenda item at our, I think it's last two or three meetings, I've lost count at this point, um, now would be the time for you to speak. So we do have a running list of who's spoken in the past. Um, and so we ask that you please raise your hand and somehow my, I lost my participants list. So give me a minute for me to see that there's hands. Um, and each speaker in this section will have three minutes. So again, I will turn it over to, uh, Elizabeth. Um, I believe I have also lost my participant screen. Just a moment. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. Ah, it looks as though we have a one current uh, raised hand on the list. That's Ar Arno Williams mm -hmm. and followed by Harry Wagner. Uh, or not, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and you may begin to speak. Uh, hello, all uh, XCAP committee members. Thank you again for all your work. Um, I would like to comment on uh, Meadow at uh, Charleston. And again, um, 
yeah, really press for not choosing uh, the partial underpass option. Um, I measured the turning cycle of our cargo bike and some of the U-turns are really impossible. Um, so people riding to school with their kids uh, will not be able to use um, these, the, to use the cycling paths in this design. Um, as for the other options, I think I mean, they leave the, the cycling and car uh, routes intact. So I would say it's a matter of all our deliberations like uh, cost and um, aesthetics. Um, so with that, in that regard, um, I would say, I mean, the trench is probably the most visually appealing, but very costly. Um, the viaduct um, is very visually unappealing. I lived in a town where there used to be a viaduct through town in Delft in the Netherlands, and they actually ended up destroying it and build, building a tunnel. And it was also always a mess under the under this viaduct. Um, so I would argue that uh, the most visually appealing and cost-effective um, thing to build would be the uh, the hybrid option. Um, so yeah, those are my comments. Thank you very much for all your work. Thank you very much for your comment. Uh, our next speaker is Carrie Wagner. Go ahead and unmute yourself and you may begin to speak. Hi, thank you. Um, I would like to speak to the Charleston Meadow designs. Um, I would really like us to study the trench more after, especially after Keith's um, updates on, on possible um, savings in the estimates. I think that makes it much more in line with some of the other, some of the other um, options and worth studying. It would really not tear up our neighborhood. The whole thing could just be underground. That sounds so much better than a viaduct, which um, really, I mean, I understand some, it's the easiest thing to put in, but Really, I mean, look at the Embarcadero. That thing, when they tore that thing down, the whole area opened up in San Francisco. It's beautiful. Um, we really need to not be putting viaducts um, down the peninsula or through the center of our city. So please, um, I'm looking forward to hearing what um, the engineering firm, what they give us reasoning for their costs and see if we can bring those estimates down and look at the trench more. and. Um, Regardless of the option chosen, I really do want um, a protected underpass or overpass for bikes and pedestrians somewhere in South Palo Alto. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carrie. Uh, I currently do not see any other raised hands. Oh. Great. Um, so I did want to give I probably should have done the staff presentation first, but staff, you said you had some updates for us. So if we could hear those. Um, and then I would ask if, if we've had a lot of members of the public talk about their cargo bikes and stuff, it would be super helpful if anybody is technical enough to send us descriptions of how wide of a turn would be useful in something like the underpass. If, it, if there had to be some design changes, that would really help. I did want to acknowledge that Tony's here. Hi, Tony. Um, uh, but uh, again, going back to the underpasses, if you've got cargo bikes, what is, what's the turning radius on those kinds of things? And what would, what would help with those designs? Because I think any numbers would be um, useful to understand. Um, okay, Philip, did, are you doing that present? I see you, I see you and not Rippin, so I'm guessing it's you. <laughs> well, I'll at, least, I'll at least start and then I'll bug Rippin to join in. Sure. Um, so I just wanted to speak really quickly about the, um, the cost uh, differences that were identified, um, you know, from the trench and um, the, um, you know, pure trenches, I guess, as we'll call them, um, the trench option here. And, you know, as an example, San Gabriel and the Reno uh, retract project. Um, we talked with um, AECOM and, you know, they could still get us more information on this and still trying to track down some information, but just want to speak really specifically about the San Gabriel project. As I think I mentioned, that's a project that I'm pretty uh, familiar with in some ways. Um, I actually saw it under construction. So um, my wife's parents live right next to that. Um, and they love it. <laughs> um, but that said, um, the bid occurred back in like 2013, 2014. And the EIR document listed the project as a $495 million uh, project. So we're still trying to track down whether the um, that 300 or a little bit under $300 million estimate that um, Keith found 
actually included costs outside of construction. Um, there are, there has, uh, we've have, have found some conflicting information about this. So we're not really sure. We're trying to um, track down a contact down there to figure out, um, but noting that that project does have some significant differences um, from the trench project in Palo Alto, um, specifically that uh, it's a single track, non-electric train, which um, is a significant difference. Um, Isn't it three tracks, the San Gabriel Trench? The photographs we've seen all have three tracks. So they, are, it, it, they did construct three tracks, but it's a single track train that operates there. Um, so they only required, um, in order to do the construction, they only required the single track shoe fly, which they did within their right of way. Okay. Okay. So, um, this, so yeah, you can look, um, actually Rippon found a presentation where they showed the construction, but I was curious about it because I saw them when they were doing the construction, I was like, oh, it's really interesting. I remember they were doing the construction there, but I never saw a difference as a, you know, vehicular, um, driver going through that intersection until all of a sudden the, the trench was open. So yeah, they never had any changes there. They owned enough right of way that they could do all the construction within their right of way. They didn't have to acquire any right of way additionally. Um, so it was kind of a, a little bit different in that. Um, the other thing is, you know, as we noted last week in the discussion that it was a very competitive bidding environment. Um, and um, this project was obviously part of a much larger um, regional project, which does indeed lead to cost efficiencies. And, you know, we can note the cost um, escalation that's really necessary to compare costs um, to our project, but that also doesn't account for the Bay Area labor and expenses, which are really much higher. And I can only tell you my anecdotal information for this, but back in 2012, I was told that the difference is 20% for the Bay Area over Los Angeles. Um, and I would guess that it's, um, you know, switching now over to the Reno project, I would guess it's even um, higher than uh, in Reno. I, I would guess LA is higher than Reno. <laughs> um, and Bay Area is much higher than um, LA. So um, the Reno retract project was actually the project that was used as the cost basis for um, the cost estimate for this um, R trench in Palo Alto. So escalating their costs up to our cost, um, noting that they were their bid document was probably in early 2000. And um, we believe that their cost that is shown here, the 282 million is also only construction cost. Um, a lot of times when companies list how much the cost costs, they only list their project um, construction costs. They don't list um, the actual full end, the management cost and all those other things. And a lot of times those other costs spill into other types of projects that are related. So it's not as easy to break it out and they really only list the construction cost. So I know that's um, a lot of information that we also talked about last week. So I'm not necessarily sharing a lot of new information um, but we're hoping to get a little bit more information as we try and um, talk to somebody at um, the SG um, COG down there um, and um, see if we can find a contact at, at, for the San Gabriel project. But I just wanted to share that quick information regarding costs. Looks like uh, Tony had a question. Yeah, and I did want to acknowledge that Inyoung is here. Oh, uh, go name? ahead, Tony. Tony, um, you're muted. Philip, I'm just um, wondering, and I'm hoping, and I think it's true, that the costs are uh, e equally evaluated across all of the options. I'm yeah, so I, I think we were gonna get to your, your question, which your question was about the cost per linear foot. No, correct? no, this is a different question. I, my belief Oh, you're talking about, yeah, 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 yes. Yeah. Yes, I, so you're asking, did AECOM, when they did their cost estimates, did they use the same type of escalation and equation in order to calculate their estimates? And the answer is yes. Thank you. So, Craig. Yeah, yeah, I guess my question is sort of related. I mean, I am not an expert in construction and construction costing. I think Tony might be. I think Tony is. But in your opinion, Philip and, and Rippon, as people who do construction projects, do you think that AECOM is not estimating properly? Or do you think that they're somehow biased in favor of one alternative for another and they're inflating their costs deliberately in order to choose us, cause us to choose something different? And I'm saying that because I got 50 emails over the last week, 
implying that AECOM was somehow biased against certain options and was changing the estimates based on this bias. Yeah, so as soon as I, you know, first, you know, Rippon and I talked through some of this stuff last week, I think, you know, we talked about, we didn't even think about the Bay Area labor thing until afterwards, um, but I can recognize that, that is a real fact. Bay Area labor is significantly higher um, than other places. You just look at our housing price and you figure these people have to live somewhere. They have to be paid salaries. The salaries are higher. Um, no, I don't think that their cost estimates are unreasonable. Although, you know, you do look at other projects throughout um, you know, time and, and a lot of times estimates are high, but not always, they're not always high. So, you know, you want to conservatively estimate, but sometimes projects are underestimated. And we've had that happen in the city where we've had estimates that were not high enough and we've had to revise them. Um, I think, you know, recent projects we've had that are fairly significant ended up coming back higher than, you know, we had estimated. So I guess all of that, all of that is to say, this is a lot of money, so I can understand why there's apprehension to accepting these numbers. But I think this is um, this information has been arrived at using the best available information that we have at this time. Yeah. Also, I like to add that usually at this planning level, there are a lot of unknowns of, uh, which are not confirmed. So usually, the planning level estimates do include contingencies. Um, so, for example, uh, St. Gabriel in their environmental documents estimated about $500 million in 2011 for their design and uh, for the construction costs. Whereas if, uh, you know, if everything is accurate or, you know, that $272 million is also reflecting of the cost that was less than what they anticipated in the environmental document phase. So, you know, again, there may be unknowns that they found in the design phases uh, or, or there were some cost savings because of the you know, economy, like uh, Philip mentioned, there may be other reasons why their costs were lower than their expected cost. Now, it could have gone the other way around and gone up as well, because depending upon the time you bid, the, competent, the, the competition, the bid competition uh, and, and the prices of the commodities, it, it, it can really affect the, the cost um, you know of the proposed project uh, in, in general so it, even um, we were lo looking at the San Gabriel versus uh, our project in, in finding some of the uh, some of these you know uh, um, documents um, what an additional thing that we could look for we were looking for is their groundwater pumping cost. Um, so it, it the groundwater cutoff wall seem, does not seem to be required in their project, which was uh, you know required, uh, which is required on our project. So we are trying to confirm those documents. We even re we are reaching out to their engineers to see if they can talk to us and discuss with us what some of those costs were and some of the consultants who may have been around at that time to see if they can shed some more light on it so that we can understand better on why uh, they're, they're, these costs are extremely different. Uh, but yeah, like uh, uh, Philip mentioned, there are several uh, um, and several unknowns. The, the, there's, the, and the, they have only built one track within the, so they, 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 sh they have room for three tracks, but they only built one track. They don't have only one track for shoe fly. And then if they are all within their, uh, within, I mean, the traffic control and the environmental assessments are all can uh, leap into this whole cost. So, so um, again, from the perspective of, you know, we would think that uh, our consultants are unbiased and provide us, uh, uh, you know, fair information based on their professional opinions and not uh, change any of their, um, uh, you know, the, the cost to bias any decision because it is in the interest of the city and it's in the interest of art that all the costs that are shown are represented professionally. They are professional engineers and they should be providing us those professional opinion based on their, uh, their estimates that they have developed. So I would hope and sincerely think that that's what they're doing. Thank you. Um, Phil, I see your hand up. Yes, uh, Ripon, I have a question for you. Uh, you've used the term shoe fly, which we generally understand to mean a temporary bypass during construction. Uh, you also said that the railroad built just one track 
through, even though they had room for three. So is it possible the second track was actually used for passing operations? Actually, if I could interrupt, Phil, I'm going to show, if I could share my screen with everybody. So um, I realized that Philip and Rippon were not with the city when we had a presentation, but back in, this, in October of 2017, um, our city manager, Ed Chicada, actually invited Mark Christopheles, who was the project manager for the entire Alameda Corridor East, which included the San Gabriel Trench. And so actually on XCAP's website, if you go under um, meeting materials where you usually see XCAP, if at the very top you click on related items, we have a presentation that's um, called the Alameda Corridor East San Gabriel Valley presentation. And that actually has a lot of information in it. I'm actually gonna share my screen now to answer your question, um, uh, Phil, cause I think it'll help you. So, um, for people to understand when we talked about last week that the port of LA and the port of Long Beach, there's a, these big cargo trains that unload. And so the area where their freight was a lot of cities all together. And so it was taking a long time. This is all the number of grade separations that they had to do along the various areas. And it was mostly for Union Pacific trains. I'm skipping quickly, but I'm gonna show you a picture in a second. So when it was completed, uh, this is what they ended up with. But what they started, they only had one track that was operating. They had that one at the surface and they had enough right away to build the trench next to it and then stick those in there. So unlike our situation where we have to have two operating electrified trains on a, on a passing track, they were able to keep their operations on the single track up top while they built the stuff next to it. Yeah, actually not just one minor point. Uh, the freight trains are going eastbound. That is container ships are unloaded and then the containers are loaded for movement east. The uh, westbound trains into the port are, are coming in empty. Yes. Yep. Um, and so th there's a lot of construction pictures. You guys can go look at these. They have pictures about how they got the walls done. I won't go through those. This one's sort of interesting. Um, sorry, this one, but it's really hard to read on mine. But the overall cost, that was the number. And then you have construction management right away, uh, UPRR, and um, I have Mark Christopheles' contact information um, for Philip and Rippon. So if you guys wanted to, he's no longer, he's moved on from the project because I think they've actually shut down that authority. But, um, but I did want to show people this key graph. Hold on, let me get there. Sorry, it's a very long presentation. There's all sorts of, everyone can geek out on this. But I thought this one was interesting. So it's the San Gabriel Trench time overall. So it took three and a half years to design it. You have this right of way time. And then the construction time was almost six years. So I did want to, we had a conversation last week about just kind of how long this takes. Um, and, you know, I did want to say that it took a while. And this is, I think, a picture of kind of what it ended up looking like. Not the best picture, but. So um, if folks want to look at that in more detail, you can you can get a lot more from there. Yeah, it's on the I'm Connecting not... Palo Alto website. Yep, it's under related materials. One theme we yeah, seem I... to be seeing, oh, sorry. Uh, one question. You said six years. I mean, I saw when they talked about this project, they said it was done in under four years. That was on their website. So Keith, I just have to tell you, there's a lot of conflicting information out there as Rippon and I found as we were going through documents, pouring through documents about this. There's so much conflicting inf information about this. Um, this presentation was the most recent information that we had yeah. uh, from this project, which was a follow up after the project was completed. So I'd consider this to be, you know, relatively more um, accurate. Yeah, um, in fact, this one is dated, <laughs> it's dated 2017, but the, the construction chart, um, Keith, goes through June of 2018. So it wasn't even quite finished at the time yeah, that, right. that Mark Christopheles was talking to us. Yeah, I, I guess the question would be is not so much how long the construction took, but how long would it interfere with Alma? So we'd have to look at the phasing and Right. If, if they're doing stuff inside the trench that's not affecting Alma, then we really don't care if they're still doing construction. Right. But I think the, the point here is that they were able to maintain their operations and build the train the trench next to it because they had enough right away. In our situation, we'd have to encroach on Alma just to be able to build the actual trench. And yes. so that's the that's kind of the main yeah, difference. Nadia, do you mind, huge... If you still have it up, do you mind sharing slide 10? I think that was the one where... Yeah. Um, it's like actually eight, nine, and 10, I think, were really interesting yeah. um, there. So this is. The... So it says there it can accommodate three tracks. Um, and then the next one is just, it only has one active track. Yeah, which so, they kept at the surface. And then 
I think is this like they 10? built next to it. Yeah. This, so if you go back up to 10, um, that's 10. where it says the San Gabriel tr trench only had to be wide enough for three tracks and only required one temporary track. All construction could occur within existing UPRR property. So they did all the construction in the property. Yeah, and this well, image is flipped, but it shows like they kept the, the train at the surface and they, they, they dug out the trench next to it. So to shoot hey, this and rebuild the roadway is also an additional cost, right? So. Yeah. Um, yeah, for those um, of you who have never tried to look at construction costs along these things, it's very, very complicated. <laughs> as Elizabeth can tell you, as she's looked at the high school real stuff for many years. Tony, yeah. I mean, I, I've sort of poured through this construction cost estimate three times, I think. And I, I find it very accurate in terms of categories that are evaluated. And across the categories, uh, across our options, they seem to be consistent. If we disagree with the cost on, on option one, it's the same disagreement on option two. So I, I too think that they have been a little bit more conservative, meaning they've been cautious about costs not being too low. Uh, so they are a little bit high and I like that because I hate surprises that are negative. I'd rather have a surprise that it went down. Uh, so I think the costs are a little bit high, but appropriate for this stage. Uh, so that's my opinion, having on the construction side. Yeah, I would agree with that assessment. It's just you never know when you start digging what you know different conflicts you might run into. So I, I think that's that's a fair assessment, and I would say is equitable across the different um, alternatives. So I guess one assumption in this in the diagrams that they have done for us is the assumption that they have to leave the right of way to be able to to do the trench. And, and I guess my question is, is that an assumption that can be questioned or that, that can be sort of negotiated with Caltrain? I mean, that right away is 150 feet, so they actually have space. And you know, depending on if you put the trench on the outer bank um, towards Alma or even towards the, the homes, I'm just curious if that changes where you could position the trench. So I guess, Mike, you know, one of the, we asked a bunch of questions uh, that are in the notes. So if you, um, attachment A of option of uh, item number five on our agenda has our deliberation notes from last week. And one of the questions is what are the main cost drivers for each alternative? How can we drive prices down? So that would be one of my questions is, is the position of the trench movable, you know, east to west such that we don't have to have encroachment on Alma? Like where does that, what drives that assumption that we have to encroach that way? Yeah, so you, we did uh, ask uh, AECOM and preliminary, they gave us some um, major uh, cost uh, dr uh, and drivers. Of course, right away is always a cost of cost driver. And if we are utilizing cities um, uh, facilities like roadway as a, as a shoe fly or a detour option, those costs are not accounted for in some ways because that's you know uh, a, a cost that is already in uh, uh, incurred and the city is contributing towards it. So, so yeah, uh, right away is always going to be like, if you minimize the interruptions, if you minimize the construction timing, if you, so those are always going to help uh, reduce the construction cost. But those uh, ty types of value engineering may be done in the subsequent phases to determine how we can further improve. Uh, but where I, they did, uh, uh, you know, in their estimates, the major cost drivers that they were looking for um, was for like trench was retaining wall and groundwater cutoff wall construction. Uh, that was a significant amount of uh, a, a bigger chunk of uh, the, their cost estimate. So that like for them, like for hybrid uh, track work uh, will primarily be uh, you know permanent and uh, a, a, a shoe fly that we would be need to build that would be uh, you know the cost that were driving factors for the uh, uh, for the hybrid option. For viaduct. Uh, Sorry, you know, actually, Rupert, I'm going to ask you to slow down because I'm trying to take notes and I didn't catch. So. Uh, for the first one, for the you said a retaining wall. What was the first one? A retaining wall with retaining what? Wall and groundwater cutoff wall construction. And that was for which alternative? 
for trench as well as underpass because for those options they would have to build those kind of structures to be able to work uh, okay. on that. Uh, wall and groundwater cut off wall construction. Okay. And for like hybrid, it's uh, the track work. Uh, track work, uh, the railroad track work is the primary cost, which is the permanent and temporary shoe fly. Okay. And then for viaduct itself, it's it's primarily the structure because the structure itself is so. So that those are the major um, costs that are in their cost estimates. You know, like you know, of course they didn't take into consideration the right of way utilized on the city's portion as a cost in the project. So therefore, you know, those cost reduction. Uh, there's no cost reduction, but significant time reduction that could occur if everything was done on their right of way. So we can yeah. definitely look into that in the subsequent. But were they phases. able? were they able to identify what what assumptions were driving the costs in certain ways that, so that can, they like, could go back to caltrain on that is your second question i think uh, what assumptions if change could significantly lower the cost or reduce the complexity that is your second question and what we have done right now is uh, designed the the, uh, the design the uh, the projects to meet the caltrain specifications for most part and there's some exceptions that we have already identified but again if all of those design criteria if you could it could be you know they may have whatever design criteria is, is it, it needs to be further than studied with the Caltrans if that needs to any modification or considered because they would kind of require some kind of variance and additional technical studies for that. So at this stage, you can't, I mean, any and all factors are uh, that, that are their design factors uh, get into this consideration of the design elements, which are then the the, the, the construction that has to be constructed. So, so you know, but surely uh, not every, each assumption. I mean, there's certain for certain assumptions, there's certain design things that are really sticking and are really are really the ones that will cut the cost in a way that is more significant than for others, right? Typically, everything is designed to the minimum level of design effort. So, if anything now it has to be changed, um, that could be grade right away. Uh, shoe flies, vertical clearances, anything that relates to the design elements of the structure, whether it be trench, whether it be viaduct, whether it be, all those are going to affect costs, uh, like you're saying, but, you know, we, we, we haven't, we cannot analyze it. it every, all that analysis requires then realignment, redesign of realignment to some level, uh, preliminary level to understand what kind of co cost variance it's going to be, because if one thing can affect multiple things in the in the actual uh, full implementation of the design. So as a result, you can't just say, oh, because because the drains are driving at, instead of 110 miles per hour at 80 miles per hour, that they would be there would be uh, like 10 10 percent of the score, uh, cost differences, uh, or this may be a major redesign would be happening. So, uh, but when you are looking at certain elements, then you look at what other design features will be negotiated in order to accommodate this particular action. And that's what causes us to look at what design exceptions would be kind of needed. So it's a, it's a rigorous exercise that you would have to perform in order to identify it in more detail, I would say. Okay, I see um, uh, Phil Burton and then Greg. Yeah, uh, so uh, Ripon, do you know to what extent AECOM was having even informal communications with Caltrain. And the reason I'm asking is that Caltrain may have told AECOM about how to align a trench to allow them to go to a four track structure in the future, even though AECOM may or may not have been aware of that that may have been a Caltrain motor. I'm just speculating, but I'm asking. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm only three months with City of Palo Alto before that. What happened I means again, I have not uh, been very well um, equipped with what conversations or what communications had happened in the past. Uh, typically, they would have some kind of, you know, uh, you know, design standards from the from the agency that they would utilize to to 
pre prepare these kind of preliminary designs. Yeah, but, the, but the design standards wouldn't necessarily say if you have extra right of way, you have to center the trench within that total right of way width. So and, and I, I have to say also, you know, the same thing for me. I also wasn't around when the trench was initially designed. But um, what I'd say is um, they, they did have Caltrain's um, design standards at the time. Um, I don't know that the four tracking issue came up um, until later. I'm, so that's another thing I'm not really sure about. Maybe somebody who's been involved in this process longer than I have been could speak to that. So I'm not really sure. Yeah, I mean, by the way, I have no special information here. I'm just concerned about it because we know the Caltrain's position, uh, at least in the letter that we got a few months ago, is very conservative. Yep. And they want to leave themselves maximum flexibility. Well, if I could say, is I mean, I, I'm obviously not an engineer, but Philip and Rippon, you should be able to speak to this. Um, typically, when the city signs a contract with AECOM, as you guys explained last time, there's various teams. I mean, AECOM is a very large multinational company. So, for example, the AECOM folks who built the Long Island Railroad with the jacked box is not the same as the team working here in, in Palo Alto, right? Clearly. And yeah, and my understanding, however, is that there's what's called a firewall. And so technically the teams that are working with the cities are not necessarily the same as the AECOM who is partnered with Caltrain for their own nope. internal designs. Right? Yeah, so to clarify, they, they, yes, you're correct. They're not the same team. Um, and even, you know, going back to the cost estimate um, discussion, they had a separate person that's the cost estimator on the team. Um, but um, yeah, you're right. This is not the team that worked um, with Caltrain uh, on those, you know, any of those, um, any of their projects specifically. So there is a different uh, team that works there. But I think what the question was still applies is, um, you know, did AECOM have Caltrain's design standards at the time? Well, to my, I don't think Caltrain has a four track design standard because they haven't, what, they have not solidified their agreement with high speed rail. Yes, and so that that's exactly what I would I would agree with that statement. Um, yeah. So uh, to your point, Phil, it, it, when it, it was designed. Yeah, it couldn't. The, so they have not. Um, Caltrain and High Speed Rail have been arguing about this since 2012. They have an MOU which is based on a generic understanding of operations, but they have never gone through the technical review necessary to design whatever the four track requirements would be. So it's not really possible that any AECOM designs were influenced by some internal standards that Caltrain has, yeah. because if they had those, we would have gotten them already. In fact, yeah. Caltrain has said clearly to us in their email, hey, we don't know yet what any of this is gonna look like. Exactly. And, and it's gonna take us two years to at least figure this out. Okay, I'm and just raising that. Uh, yeah, listen, I'm not trying to be a bomb thrower here. I'm just trying to raise a point of concern. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Greg, I see your hand. So Following up on your other questions, okay, so question number two and three is similar to that, that the Caltrain design standards, um, you know, like vertical clearance, free operations, shoe flies, all can be, you know, um, the, some of these exemptions that can Well, be, but number uh, number two had a specific question about, um, about whether the, changing the vertical curve, reducing freight train speed would change the vertical curve. So that would be a more like a change that Caltrain would want uh, to be considered, to, uh, you know, uh, that, that previous answers like they would say any changes to the Caltrain standard must be considered in an area that is careful, deliberate, and fully and fairly weighs both benefits and consequences and undertake on a system-wide basis. So I think that would be uh, something that would have to be uh, uh, at planning stage, we we could not uh, evaluate it, but if needed, it would require design variance and a lengthy process that might have technical studies associated with it. So, but uh, Phil, did you say at our last meeting that you had sent in the your calculations on the vertical curve and that you someone had, um, had indicated to okay, you? Okay, well, I had sent a while back. I. I submitted them to our group as, as just one of submissions. And one of the AECOM engineers sat down with me and said, first of all, uh, the, the, the distances involved are only half the ones that I calculated. Second, he had these reasons why it couldn't be done. Okay, but you didn't get anything in writing? No, it was just an thoughts. informal calculation with sketches. Okay, okay. And things like POC, point of curvature, and other uh, civil engineering geometric terms. Okay. Uh, okay. Sorry, uh, Ripon. I just wanted to get clarification on that. So go ahead. Yeah. 
So but, I will go to number uh, number four. Your uh, um, cost per, uh, costs were pretty elabor nicely elaborated by uh, Phil. For cost per lineal foot, you know, as Tony um, requ requested, I did a you know brief uh, you know <laughs> uh, calculation based on what was given in their uh, fact sheets, and I can show it to you and maybe later on send it to you also. Um, that way you can take a look at it, but you know, those are based on whatever was on the fact sheets. Um, and let me see if I can show my screen. Ripon, um, what I'm also suggesting that we make transparent is the cost per, uh, per foot for different kinds of components. For instance, the ramp has a different, uh, Different kind of uh, cost sure. than the by the than the structure, and and yeah. I think the issue the question is I think there are several really smart people in this city that can look at these things and configure that make minor adjustments and save costs. So that was the no. I mean, I, I absolutely agree with you, but usually at this stage, like you mentioned, is more like a you know uh, you know a cost estimate, and then you next as we move on to the next stages, then you look into more development of the uh, uh, you know alternative, and then look into the value engineering and cost savings and more refined cost estimates. Yes, I, so, I agree. Yeah. I think they're working so on a very large cocktail napkin. <laughs> so we definitely follow up all those, you know, I, I all the capital improvement projects of the large scale that I have done, usually we would have a preliminary budgetary cost. This is a budgetary cost estimate that we try to look at then at 35 or 40 percent when we get to that level of details, because you would have a major, uh, you know, uh, a, 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 you know, point uh, of um, design, we, we would be able to do that those as well. So, so yeah, we would develop more of a cost estimates at those stages to reflect the known quantities and known information, the better information we have, the better quality of, uh, you know, uh, of our um, estimates would be. And also, it also reflects the newer prices, because, you know, you can see the prices of the steel changes significantly year over year, price of concrete changes significantly year over year. And, and you know, like, we were building a bridge in one of our uh, location, and the prices of the steel was heavily changed because of the the trade tariffs that were hit by China to the China. So again, we have some of these things we don't have any control on. And as we move along, these one will be developed and more refined. Okay. So, but, but again, to say, um, uh, you know, I did try to come up with all these different structure costs, right away cost, support cost, escalation cost, and then look at the cost was, you know, the not without the ex escalation and support cost and look at those, um, you know, um, uh, um, per lineal foot cost from on the construction cost only as of whatever 2018 or 2020 data that they had for the construction cost, and then total costs um, based on uh, escalation as well as um, the support costs. So, so you could see that you know playing with these numbers, you could see how it, or looking at these numbers, how these one would affect uh, different um, elements of the project cost. Thank you, Rupin. This is awesome. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So I did want to ask the uh, Rupin on the on question number three. We had, in other words, um, would AECOM suggest we ask Caltrain to think about? Did did, so they, did they have suggestions for us of things that they would recommend that we ask Caltrain about besides the design alternatives or the design variances that are already identified in the matrices? So some of, uh, um, like you mentioned, right of way, right of way is one of the uh, significant, uh, you know, element. Uh, we, if we can utilize less right of way, uh, uh, you know, outside the um, less outside right of way, I would say, that would certainly be helpful. Um, but, uh, if shoe fly can all be located within the the railroad right of way. Um, other things they mentioned uh, were, um, uh, you know, vertical clearances maximum grades that can be allowed, um, shoe fly operations, you know, like if, so some of those kind of uh, questions, uh, suggestions they, they made for the, for the technical assumptions. Okay, so in other words, 
right now they're making us assume two fl shoe flies in each place, but if there was a way to get a waiver to make it down to one shoe fly for a very limited zone, then that could have significant cost impacts. And that goes back to why Caltrain is looking at this entire thing across all of its operations and not just Palo Alto, right? And even limiting the grades on that shoe fly, because if you had to design that for, um, you know, same as the permanent standards, it would be much more, or you could, and you'd lack the shoe fly, that would be even helpful in certain ways. Okay. That's good to know. Um, yeah. Coming to your question number six, uh, you had like, uh, is it feasible to raise the tracks by one to two feet? And so, yeah, you, that, that raising the tracks two feet definitely can be, uh, be feasible. And, you know, if we do that, it will say lower the grade by 1% from 5% to 4% at Charleston. And also it would reduce the same two feet at uh, and result in a flatter grade for Park Avenue. So, so it could go down from nine to 12% to seven to 9%. So it, it, it will relatively help um, um, grades on those uh, interchanges. Because you can do that areas. just on the west side. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, and uh, uh, regarding the the swinging of the tracks, um, so in in finding out on that one, what they have done is designed the alignment based on the Caltrain standards at this time. So if yeah. that means if there's any uh, you know tangent lengths or reverse curves or uh, or, or, or or the elevations, um, you know the, uh, grades and everything, they have taken into account all all that. So if if it, it's consistent with their design standards, then Caltrans typically would approve those designs, and therefore we are considering that. Yeah. So this is this is this is <laughs> this is a familiar theme for folks who've been watching me for a while. So I know that they've met the standards for how quickly they can turn to the side and move the tracks outward. But my question is a different question, which is that because they are trying to ensure the possibility of four tracks, the the east-west position, the lateral movement along the tracks is different. Mm -hmm. And so just because it meets their current standards doesn't mean it meets their four track potential standards. And to say that, yeah, they have not looked into account or taken okay. into account. So we, so because what I wanna make sure is really clear for everybody is that that makes it so that it's possible that the position of the viaduct, which some people like better because it swings away from the homes that are on the west side may actually have to stay in its current position. And that may or may not impact how much people like it. But I think it's really important and it's part, been part of my ongoing concern is that the video and all the images that we've shown reflect a potential position that may not necessarily be one that we're allowed to do. And regarding your last question on the uh, on the light planes, uh, so the alignment that is provided uh, or that was prepared, like the plan and profile that was prepared for our wire that is accurate to what we have, what we know of to date. And, um, you know, so we usually there would be minor changes as we move along and refine those in the next design phases. So, that, but, but in general, though, that, um, that, um, uh, that alignment is ac uh, accurately just showing what we know of for the design at this time. And, uh, you know, if, if that needs to be used, uh, that, that can be plotted and, um, you know, calculated for the design uh, for the you know the light planes. But you know, if it is of a important consideration to uh, to our community, then we can also include that in the environmental process. So if you if you want to make that as a suggestion or recommendation, that light planes should be calculated or identified in in the next steps. That that would be um, that could be a suggestion in your alternative and then the environmental documentation will review it and show what kind of uh, impacts it does have. Nadia, I would like to suggest that we include something like that, uh, that it, we use the zoning ordinances um, daylight plane and that the structure should be outside of that daylight plane uh, for us to accept it, I think. Well, I think we can request it. The problem is that ultimately Caltrain decides where the structure goes, right? So, um, and, and also the, if the you know the significant mitigations are non significant, I mean, if it is significant, then we can be yeah. mitigated. But I, I would like to add that from my experience with uh, viaducts, including the one in the background, 
of my virtual picture. Um, ground light plane is a big issue for vertical structures and community acceptance, in addition to noise, of course, and just yeah. plain old visual impact. So I, I want to just reinforce what Tony is saying. I'd also like to mention that I doubt that Caltrain would allow us to do a single track shoot fly because in the rush hour, they need to have passing trains because the trains are operating at frequent schedules and a single track would just gum up the schedules in both directions, a single shoe fly track. Although they have done it before. So they know. have, but I can't imagine doing for the lengths of track we're talking about. Probably not their preference, but um, I did want to thank, we did have a member of the public who was kind enough, I don't know if you guys saw that, to calculate the light plane and send us their, their best guess calculations on the light plane. So. I heart Palo Alto, thank you. Those are the kinds of things that our residents do and send to us for fun. And I just wanted to say that I appreciated that. Um, so, um, okay, anything else that you wanted to tell us about the discussions with AECOM? No, I think that was more like it. So that concludes my staff update. Okay. Um, yep, Larry's got his hand up. I thought we'd also uh, ask them, we're going to ask them about the uh, environmental uh, issues that uh, Keith had raised, for example, that, uh, that uh, in his view that, uh, or what he obtained, uh, the siphon looked like a more uh, satisfactory solution than uh, what AECOM had, had suggested. Yep, good point. And I'm not sure that that was well captured in my questions. Yeah, I'm not sure that we didn't see that in the questions, but um, I, I'm also not sure if that's something that could be answered at this phase of the, you know, design. I'm not sure, Ripon, if you have thoughts on that, but I think that's kind of unlikely that they're going to be able to figure that out at this level of design. I think what we did is in the, in the top part of the notes, we have issues that need more information, which is geotechnical soil analysis, then groundwater, how would flow be impacted in the various uh, in the hybrid trench and underpass and what considerations need to be made regarding leakage and then creeks understanding creek flows siphons pumps and their potential impacts on mitigations that we have for the trench right, yeah uh, 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 two other things i want to mention while i have the floor here yeah the first is that we've received uh, many many emails suggesting that we should get a quote independent analysis quote of the cost and i just want to mention that um, uh, AECOM is independent. I, I uh, don't like to see a consultant being uh, suggested that uh, uh, as being somehow biased, as far as I can see, uh, AECOM has been given us their best professional opinion, uh, their best professional opinion people can certainly disagree with. So I think when people are really requesting is a second opinion, but a second opinion to me is different than an independent opinion. Uh, so uh, I, I just want to put that out there just so uh, I, I don't want to see the idea get out there that somehow AECOM had a uh, particular result in mind. I, I don't see any evidence of that. And uh, that doesn't mean I, we have to agree with it, but at least it seems to me we ought to acknowledge that they've been professional in their approach. Uh, lastly, um, uh, I'm concerned about where we're going. Uh, uh, Keith has done some very good research and his report is in writing. Uh, and our report, if we accept it or not, uh, is going to uh, live for a very long time. And our report is going to be considered by the city council, uh, which will have at least two new members uh, come January 1st, 2021. And it may be that the, 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 the council won't even get a round to this uh, in 2021. Uh, so there may be other new members by the time uh, uh, final decisions are made by the city. So I think we have to be very careful to have everything in writing. So uh, since Keith's uh, uh, positions or what he found in his research is there, I think we need to have something that really uh, either confirms or rebuts uh, what he has. And I think we've heard a lot about uh, differences in cost calculation today from Ravon and Phil, uh, but I think we really need to have that in uh, a careful report by them. I know that's uh, asking a lot, but I think it's really essential so that 
somebody in 2021 or 2023 uh, reading this will have a firm picture of what uh, uh, really was there. So I, I would hope we can get staff to uh, show that, uh, just for example, that uh, the uh, Alam Bill, is that an agreement or, or you want to? Yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, that, that's not a problem. I, I think you're right. We, it'd be easier if we put it in writing for you. So we will. Um, we just we're scrambling to get the information together for today so that we could share it all with you. Um, but it's really pieced together. So we'll, we'll put it all together for you in a document. Um, we're not going to have the consultant uh, do it in recognition of their um, limited remaining budget. Um, but um, Ripon and I can put that together for you. Very good. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Uh, Greg, you had your hand up previously. I can't even remember. Um, I hope that we get to deliberating <laughs> like we talked about doing the last meeting and then spent the entire meeting on the on the trench. On the trench. I, I am curious if anybody has any updates from Burlingame, but I went to their website while we were talking and found out that they have a couple years to go when they start construction. They had to make the choice between a hybrid for the only grade crossing on the Caltrain system that has more accidents than ours. Um, and um, they had to choose between a hybrid alternative, which was originally estimated around 200 million, and a, a trench that was estimated around 400 million. And the city council chose the uh, hybrid option, and uh, but doesn't sound like they've actually started construction. They haven't even. I'm not even sure they've gone up to bid yet. So, but if we hear anything, there's a comparable project in the Bay Area where they are doing some construction on Caltrain grade separation. So if we ever get any updates from them, that'd be great. I, I thought my understanding was, I thought that they are out of money, like measure, there's not enough money in measure A. Like I, I think that they've costed their projects, but I don't think they have the money to do them. And that's yeah. why they're sort of sitting. They had actually a very small amount from Burlingame. They also had money from the state and from the federal government. Yeah, but it's just, I think not enough. Um, and I think the part of the problem is that they need Somebody has to give money to Caltrain for Caltrain to be able to do some completing stuff, and they're just not able to get that part done. I think it was part of the issue. But um, my sure. other observation in general, looking both at the, the Southern California project as well as in uh, in in, uh, in Australia, where in Melbourne for about nine billion Australian dollars they grade separated 50 grade crossings, most of them using viaducts, um, which comes out to something like 200 million Australian dollars a crossing. It does seem like there's economy and scale in having these projects be somewhat coordinated. And I think we're all a bit frustrated by our inability to coordinate this thing regionally. At the same time, I don't think waiting a couple of years to make any decisions as some members of the public have suggested is necessarily a better thing. So, okay, anybody else have any comments? Nope, seeing nobody. Okay. Um, okay, well, so to get to the part about deliberations, um, I think we talked about this last time, but it didn't happen. Um, the thought was to be able to use the um, dynamic matrix to be able to get down to the nitty gritty between each of the alternatives, because we thought it'd be a better way to have a more structured conversation. Um, and this takes a little bit of uh, uh, technical magic here, which is that Carrie has been nice enough to agree to help me fill out the matrix and she created it. But Greg Braille has to share his screen so that Carrie can still see our faces while she's typing. So um, I will let Carrie and Greg do their magic now. And um, share my screen. Do, do, do. draft XCAP new dynamic matrix. And Carrie can tell me if I've shared the right screen. Um. Looks good to me. Um, and Nadia, what is what is your vision for how to? I don't have much of a vision. It's really I'm kind of winging it here. But um, so if anybody has any more technical suggestions, I'm all ears. But what I thought might be helpful is to be able to. Um, uh, sorry, I'm adjusting my screen so I can see all your faces. Um, uh, maybe you know we can do this popcorn style. Like where are the parts where people get stuck in terms of the evaluation criteria and kind of looking at these two uh, differences and and that might be a good place to start filling stuff in so as an example oh, what did i do um okay. i did it i did it okay yeah Sorry. you're not you don't, you don't you don't have to do anything greg you can sit back now carry drives it's just we just <laughs> okay. need you to share the screen which is great um 
So, so as an, the as an ex- are what's hidden. If yes. What I hid the tunnel columns at Nadia's request at the beginning yes. of the meeting. There's still I just want to make sure the public knows. Okay. Yes. Um, and the reason we've hidden the tunnels for those of you who are watching for the first time is as a group, we had already decided to eliminate those from our deliberations because we just felt like it was very impactful and uh, way too expensive for us to really consider realistically. And so we are left with the remaining options here, which is the trench, the hybrid, the viaduct, and the underpass. Um, so uh, I can certainly start as an example. Let's see. Um, it's not really in order of the way they go. But for example, one of the things I really struggle with is, uh, let's see, I, which is minimize visual changes along the corridor. So I'm, I, I'm pretty clear between the fact that people prefer a trench visually to a hybrid and a viaduct, but I personally struggle with where, where are Palo Altans and where do I frankly stand on what's worse, the hybrid which creates this kind of wall feature or the viaduct, which as our person who lives who lived in Delft was telling us is where you know people hang out under and can become an undesirable location. And so that's an example of a spot where I don't really un, like I'm unclear on how to kind of rank those visual changes and I, you know, and so that's just an, I'm, I'm not, that doesn't have to be where we start our discussion, but I just wanted to kind of point out where there's friction and things that we might have more deliberation and debate on. And so if anyone feels strongly that there's sort of, you know, some, some, some piece of this that they think is a good place to start on discussion, I'd love to hear it. Yeah, Tony, thank you. Um, so I, I appreciate your query. My question really is, how does this matrix, in terms of its ratings, uh, uh, match with what staff or a- and AECOM have come up with, which is more a, a s- um, points, sort of not a points ra- point rating, but a color rating. Um, and the question is for Carrie, actually. So. Yeah, so I did my best to, thank you, Tony. Um, I did my best to match what their recommendations are. And if you plus these open, you can see the comments that staff made. And that's where the sub items came from. They they were sourced. So like IO1, IO2, IO3 were sourced from the comments that they made in that color coding. Um, and they're broken out by line items so that we can understand it across evenly across all of the options. Um, that doesn't mean that we have captured everything. Like if there's some other thing besides what staff has and AECOM has called out, it won't be here yet. We're going to be um, open to, to, to adding that if we need to, to understand the recommendation. But everything that was in the original version of staff and AECOM's matrix has been captured here and then kind of broken out into line items with, so you can see here, railroad tracks will be below grade with high fencing at grade is the first sentence under trench notes. And it is its own line item in cell E41. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you, Carrie. So as an example, like one thing I'd like to capture, Carrie, is if we could capture Tony's comment about the light plane. If, um, I thought it was a, a good idea. So what I'm envisioning is that um, we, as we go through this, we're just trying to say, okay, what's the, what is every suggestion we could throw at making the trench as good as possible? Same with hybrid, same with viaduct, same with underpass. And then hopefully by then we'll have coalesced on what are our preferences. And so I heard Tony's thing about the light plane, and I thought that was a great suggestion on how to improve both the hybrid and the viaduct that have an elevated feature to them. Okay, would that be a note on railroad will not be visible, or would it be it's a new line item that we want? Uh, where's the? I'm looking at I. I thought I minimize visual changes along the corridor. I thought it might go there. Yes. But, yeah. So which part? It doesn't interfere with the skyline necessarily. It's not a landscaping option. So IO3 railroad would not be visible. Would that include the light plane or does it need its own line item? Um, I think it's its own line item because line item it's, it's something that's visible but then is causing a shadow, right? Would you agree, Tony? This is your uh, really- yeah, Yes, I agree. It should be a new line item because it's sort of, a, it, this daylight plane has been in place for about 25 years and it's sort of culturally accepted 
And I think it's important for us to have it as a new line on it, new item. And I guess a, a, maybe a better way to phrase this for everybody else is like, okay, if we were just looking at I for right now, visual minimize visual changes along the corridor. What suggestions would you guys make generally to improve some of these alternatives from the designs uh, that we've seen? Nadia? Yeah. Uh, uh, and Carrie, uh, actually it's called the daylight plane and it's a term, for, term of art. So in the zoning ordinance, and that's what I'm referring to, the daylight plane in the zoning ordinance. Okay, is it captured correctly? Or do you need it to say zoning ordinance? Does it have to be that specific? I think mine. I think you could put something in the notes, Carrie, maybe that says, you know, we've got Palo Alto has its own zoning ordinances and that's kind of our guideline. Understanding that Caltrain ultimately has the say, right? Yep, Phil. Oh, you're muted, Phil. Not Phil, we lost your audio for some reason. Okay, I think he's saying keep going. Maybe try unplugging and replugging, Phil. You can hear me. Oh, Phil, try one more time. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Can now you hear can. me now? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. I have this stupid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Tony, the daylight plane, is that an issue when a project comes up before the architectural review board as a go, no go element of, a, of an acceptable design? It, it doesn't come to the architectural review board or the, or the planning commission or council unless it meets the daylight plane. Staff okay. will just not send it up there. So that if this were not a rail project, the daylight plane would definitely be a key consideration. Is that a fair statement? That is fair. All right. Okay. So I think we should do no less for our project. So where do you calculate daylight uh, plane? You calculate from the pole or you calculate from the top of the train or you calculate from top of the mm, uh, great question. You know, by dock or where? There is no uh, definition, is there? Yes, there is in the zoning ordinance. Uh, well, the zoning law it is, but in the, for the building, not for the um, for the viaduct, where you you viaduct or train pole. But there must be. I think what she what he's saying is that there there is probably something in the zoning ordinance. As an example, if you have a building and then you have a flagpole, I would assume you you take the daylight plane of the actual hard structure and not the train car, which is a moving item, or the electrification pole, which is less than a foot wide or whatever. Right? Like there probably has to be some density to it. Is that right, Tony? Or, that is correct. Not yeah. Yet. Okay. So it has to be something that's like big and hefty. And my guess, my best guess is that a, a pole doesn't count, but, but the actual structure of the viaduct would. That is correct. Although the pole also has some dimensions that cannot go past a certain uh, height. Um, yeah, well, we don't get I to choose that on this. it's 15 feet above <laughs> the height limit, but... This has to be the height that it needs to be for the train to go, yeah, which yeah. we don't get to and if, if that's the case, there is no way that if they calculated that pole, there's no way they can meet that daylight saving, the daylight plane to my backyard. Right. Well, remember, this is, number one, this is for South Palo Alto, but, um, okay. but, but uh, we can't control that. That's something that is just, I mean... This is Caltrain gets to do what they want on their right of way. We can make suggestions based on our zoning ordinances, but they are not required to follow what we say. I just want to make that clear. So we're trying to be as specific as we can because there's code, but it's not really. So you're saying hold. that our code is not binding on Caltrain? Should we capture that? Is, that in the that's notice my understanding. Well? Yeah. Okay. Rip, Rippin and Philip, am I getting that right? Or? Yeah, that is correct. Yeah. Keeps, yeah. But. But we also have the power of selecting the alternative too. So we do have the ultimate power. Yes, sort of. They still have to say yes. <laughs> yeah, um, I guess we have to choose one alternative. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And if, we, if all four have some flaw, then we may end up choosing one with a flaw anyway then. But. Yeah. Does everybody agree that I have color coded good, okay, and poor correctly on the four options that we're considering? 
Yeah, I'm trying. I'm, I'm trying to understand why the viaduct is worse than the hybrid, and I'm trying to pull up the because it's taller. Is it taller? Okay. I'm, I'm uh, yeah, I think that's the whole point of the hybrid. Too long. Yeah, yeah it's, it's about five. Huh? So, and and if you notice, there's a, a line forty is kind of the roll up, and then then yeah. Carrie has broken it down, and so on on will interfere with the skyline. Um, the viaduct is, I think, poor because it's five feet higher, right? But okay, um, so twenty five feet instead of twenty feet. Yeah. yeah, but so to me, so to me, what I don't see, I don't know how to capture here, is the opinion that everybody has. Well, not that everyone has the the opinion that many have expressed, where the hybrid feels like a wall and and feels makes people feel more divided than a viaduct where you can see underneath. So I have an opinion on that, Nadia. I think. Yeah. Uh, it it as one of the um, people who spoke earlier uh, in the German city. Uh, if you have a really wide wide viaduct, it's going to look really awful. The second one is if you wide meaning four track. If it's two track, you can get light to the middle, and I'm happy with that. But um, I think it also depends on what happens underneath. If the city i'm okay if the city has public access underneath that viaduct if it's fenced off and it's hard to police i'm skeptical that that's going to work so i think okay i, I, I think you're not alone on that does, do people feel okay capturing that elsewhere where if there yeah. were viaducts then we feel like that space has to be something that the city would petition to use right so if we look at melbourne they commissioned a pretty extensive public art program Right. Um, underneath their viaducts. And of course, all the pictures are like, you know, two weeks after it was constructed. I don't know what it looks like two years later, although okay. I found some unfortunate pictures of that. Um, it, there's no reason we couldn't have a similar public art program for the hybrid, but for the viaduct, there is kind of more opportunity for community participation if Caltrain allows Palo Alto to have some control over what happens to the land under the viaduct. If Caltrain requires that we fence it off, and leave it alone to gather dust, then I agree that that would be a very unpleasant situation. Well, I think this is where Larry would probably say this is part of our negotiation with Caltrain. So if we if we are looking for something in particular, then let's try to let's Can try we? to say, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just gonna say let's try to capture it somewhere in the matrix. So do you have a natural fit for it, Carrie? Because I know you know this matrix uh, better. Yes, we do have another place for it. Before we move off of visual changes, are there any other comments on visual changes, including the color coding on the line items one, two, three, and four? I one, two, three, and four. Y yes, I do. Um, okay. And, and, and we... it, my under the viaduct, it says minimize visual changes on line forty. Um, I would say that might go to okay if it if it complies with the daylight plane. Oh, I think I would disagree, Tony. I think if you ask the average person, did 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 adding a viaduct change what that looks like? I don't think that that's a okay, right? I think it's a significant change. You may be able to make it better, but it but but that it that it minimized it. No, it's about the biggest thing and the tallest thing we could put in there. Right. Yeah, no, th that is true. But if it was a house and it's not a house, you could stay within that daylight plane, and it would right, be right. Okay. But, it, but it's definitely not. It not cannot right. stay in the day. It will not stay in the daylight plane. We talked about this um, earlier, maybe last year, but it's it's that's not. It can't. It's really tall, and there's so, no spaces. Um, right, I, and there's houses the adjacent of, to it. Top of rail is at twenty feet. The daylight plane right, but is there's no break in between, like in between houses, Tony, you have a space where you can get some cracks of sun. You're not going to get that in something that's a continuous structure, right? Yeah, I'd also like to add that, um, can you hear me now? Yep. That even if the building code as such doesn't require that a moving train be considered part of the daylight plane, I find it hard to imagine that morally speaking, we can ignore the shadow of a moving train. I think on the you mean aesthetically below. speaking, but yes. <laughs> I mean, morally speaking. I mean, it would be, to me, intellectually dishonest to say just because most of the time there's no train on the viaduct, therefore we have to, we can pretend that there's never a train on the viaduct. There will be trains, they will cast a shadow, and that shadow will affect the ground plane. And I think we are obligated to consider that. Maybe not the poles because they're very thin, 
and maybe not the power lines because they're very thin. But I think the trains have to, themselves have to be considered. So um... now I'm speaking to somebody who's lived near viaducts, rail viaducts. Um, how does this change if, so a question about how we handle the potential for four tracks. Are we as a group assuming that every recommendation that we're making is on the assumption of two tracks because that's all we've ever looked at and we're just gonna put a giant caveat at the front of our report? Or do we think it's worth going through the exercise of if this is four tracks, I feel differently about, I don't know, a viaduct than than if it's just a two-track viaduct. In other words, does that change your ranking in your mind of which ones you like better? So, so what's the category for supports possibility of four-tracking Caltrain? I don't think we have one. I mean, I think it's a, well, I guess that would be D, support continued rail operations and Caltrain service improvements. Um, I agree with Greg. I mean, I, I, I think at some point we need to record what what is easier to eventually four-track in our in expert opinion. Um, or we can get expert opinion on that. And then, but I don't know how to incorporate that, like having a, I mean, are we going to have trench, two track trench, four track trench, two track hybrid, four track hybrid? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's an existential question. And I did want to say we had a speaker earlier that was saying that under the high growth scenario for Caltrain, the four tracks were needed for a variety of other projects. But that is not what we were told by uh, Sebastian Petty of Caltrain. It's also not what's indicated in their Caltrain reports. They very specifically have said that the passing tracks are only needed for, the four tracks are in our part of Palo Alto, not in other areas, but in our part of Palo Alto are only needed because of high-speed rail. They would not be needed for the clock phase schedule um, or the, if they added a thickened transbay tube or even the Dumbarton rail potential stuff at this time. So then can we stop talking about four tracks or is it? That's, that's the question. Larry, yeah. I see you have your hand up, go ahead. Well, to follow up on what Tony just said, yes, I think we should stop talking about four tracks and instead just have one sentence or one paragraph, which is a big asterisk, and say all our considerations throughout all this time has been on a two-track basis. And if there's somehow or other four tracks, much, much more work has to be done. And yet Caltrain is hanging that as a sort of Damocles over our heads. <laughs> well, um, one of many... I don't, I don't see that they're, they're really holding it over. They're just trying to be conservative right now. When would a potential response come? I mean, we're talking years? Yes. Do any of our models include the four track? No. So then the only information we Except have been studying. I should, I should say the only alternative that we are looking currently looking at that is not impacted by four tracks is the underpass because the tracks are not moving. Well, you, you did say it correctly to say this is an existential question. Have you received any guidance on this at all from council? No, uh, we did have several. So because it was a study session, there was no official direction. Um, we did have uh, at least two council members that I can think of, maybe others who saw the meeting can chime in, who, who offered their concern about XCAP even deliberating, considering that we have this board track thing hanging over our heads and whether or not it makes sense to keep going. But we did not receive any formal direction. And so, uh, you know. Carrie, yeah. I also say this. Um, Caltrain has had a representative at almost all of our meetings, maybe all of our meetings. And nobody from Caltrain has ever jumped up and said, you guys are wasting your time because this, there is going to be a four-track solution or requirement. So it seems to me that uh, uh, for us to start considering a four-track possibility here, when we've never asked our consultants about it, that it doesn't not include it in any of our other uh, considerations, would be sort of nuts. Me anyway. I, I think that putting a, uh, a disclaimer in our report is the only thing that makes any sense at this point. Well, I would, I, yeah, if, didn't, I would, I, hold, hold on just a second. So I, I agree. That's how I feel too, uh, Larry, except one, one thing we did have one presentation 
where someone showed us four tracks in Palo Alto, but I don't know to what degree that was, you know, theoretical or actually going to happen. So uh, whoever, I, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, I think it was more of a conceptual design rather than anything specific. Okay. I just want to share what I, I think I heard from council was that this, this was a reason for um, the XCAPS report to include, include uh, pros and cons for, um, you know, decisions and different alternatives. Right, but I, I did want to argue a little bit with what Larry was saying. I think we have two newly relevant pieces of data that have shifted the position. Number one is that the, you have the high-speed rail EIR that has come out, which does not have passing tracks, and Caltrain's letter and the city's letter back is like, hey, you're going to need passing tracks and you need to tell us where they are. So Caltrain is indicating that they understand that passing tracks will be necessary if high-speed rail comes, and they're asking where that has to go. The second thing is that the Caltrain board took a board action to specifically essentially land bank and take a super conservative position, which we did not have when we started all of these drawings. And as our city manager, Ed Chicada reported to council that we, our staff and the AECOM's team, at least the ones working on this thing, were caught off guard by that move. And so it's not like that was something, nobody could have stand, stood up at a previous meeting unless they knew that the board was gonna vote that way. Um, and I will note that once that became available, Sebastian Petty told us that at our, we received emails in April where they basically indicated, hey, things have changed. We're now looking at four tracks and you see the staff push back and say, well, wait a second, are you saying four tracks for South Palo Alto or for Churchill? And they said, yeah, we, we, we recognize we've actually ratcheted back even further and are being more conservative. Now we're considering four tracks for Churchill as well until we know more. So I think we, things have materially changed. It's not the same. And so, um, you know, it's difficult for our consultant who's following the contract that they have with the city staff, with, with the city to come in and suddenly tell us that their opinion is we ought to be looking at four tracks because that's basically them asking to do more work, which I don't think they would be doing. It would be improper, nor would anyone, you know, I think for the skeptics out there, they'd say, well, no. So they would have to receive direction on that. Nadia, I don't see what, where, what you're arguing, where, where you're taking this. I you made the argument that if if we had to really consider four tracks. Let me tracks, finish, Nadia. Not, sorry, I apologize. Go ahead. Um, no, we we've spent whatever number amount of time is on the basis that there's going to that, that this is a two track. All our alternatives are a two track, except obviously the closure of Churchill and uh, the underpass. Uh, and to to say now we're going to consider four tracks where and how seems to me to be uh, a, uh, uh, an excuse for delay, uh, major delay that never be, may never be required. Uh, again, as you kindly pointed out, I like to say that this is going to end up somewhere down the line as a negotiation with Caltrain. And uh, I think there's no question on all of these alternatives in my mind that Palo Alto does not want a four track system anywhere in, in, in its uh, uh, boundaries. So uh, why would we start? Uh, I, I don't see where talking about four tracks is going to get, get, gain us anything at all right now. I, I'm simply saying you made the statement that that our consultants would have stood up and told us that, hey, you should be considering four tracks or somebody would have. And I'm, I'm making the point that I, I think that would have that's not something that would have been likely given the way things played out, nor would it be appropriate for the consultants to have stood up and said that. I, and, I didn't say consultants, Nadia. I said Caltrain people. Well, but even Caltrain, Caltrain's not going to come running to Palo Alto. I mean, they, in some ways they did. That's what that email was in April. If you read that e right, email, they're like, we just- Nadia, where are you taking this on this? I, I'm, I'm, I was responding to what you said, Larry. I'm not taking this discussion. I'm not trying to take away from the discussion we have here. I said to us, we have to have, decide whether we're going to have a giant asterisk on whether we're talking about two tracks or four tracks. But you said that Caltrain would have come to us to say something. And what I'm arguing is the board spoke, Caltrain, sent us emails in April and then Sebastian came back again. So I think they did speak and the EIR letters show that things have materially changed. I, I, I haven't heard that speech, Nadia, and it's now almost six months since uh, April. Well, yeah. I think if you watch the meeting closely, they're saying that they, the, the new policy is that they have to be very conservative and they cannot give us an answer for two years. So I hear you that you think we should continue on, on giving our alternatives for two tracks, but I wanna make the point that that is still very much in play and as much as I will just make a different political point, which is Palo Alto can object to four tracks. It's gonna be very difficult as a city to take a position on creating a pinch point for regional transit. 
if that, just if wanna, that becomes the argument. Not that I'm uh, trying to interrupt this discussion, but I just wanna mention um, something that I heard a little earlier, I think. Um, now you, you mentioned that the underpass uh, would not be uh, affected by a four track. And I just wanna, if, if, if I heard that correctly, I just wanna mention that um, the design would have to change to accommodate um, four tracks as well for the underpass. Is it because of the position of the shoe fly tracks? What has to change? Because the tracks aren't really moving, except- Ruben, do you want to speak up to that? OK, so what happens is uh, the, the, the underpass width would change, and that would impact the, the ramps uh, or the grades that would be coming up. So it would have some impacts to that. It may not be as drastic as others, but there will be redesign efforts that would be needed to accommodate for the four tracks on that alternative as well. So um, I, I think Nadia, it's my view is it's a very different study. This entire study is going to be changed significantly if we have to have four tracks. I agree. It, it's there's no point going through this anymore if we have to assume four tracks. My suggestion is to finish this with two the two two track assumption, and if it is four tracks, then down the road a new council will say to a different group, a diff a com I mean, XCAP2 to um, look at four tracks. But I think at this late stage, after two years, to switch to four tracks is horrendously difficult. Um, okay, so just to check there, so what you, you are saying is that we should have an asterisk at the beginning that says we're only going to consider two tracks and none of this preferences can be, um, indicator related to four tracks? That's not what I'm saying. I think you can asterisk something and say it's more convenient for a four track system to work there, but it's not that we have to look at all other options and say it's a, a detriment to choose one option that has only two tracks. Um. Okay, anybody else have a thought on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't see what else we could do either. I mean, I think we need to, to continue where we're going, assuming with the information we have. And but I do think we should add something to row D saying whether certain options support four tracks. But I assume that if the cost of the trench scales up as we go from two tracks to four tracks, the cost of the viaduct and the hybrid, maybe not the underpass, scale up in a similar way. And if the if the visual intrusion of the viaduct is X with two tracks, it's probably X times something with four tracks. Same for the hybrid, same for the trench. So I, so I, 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 I just, I mean, otherwise we have to go back and the council needs to tell AECOM to go redo all of their, all of their drawings and all of their renderings and, 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 and all of their plans and all of their guesstimates based on four tracks. And to me, that's, that's X cap, you know, 2.0 in 2022. So what about this? How do you feel about, because the one important piece is what Caltrain has argued to high-speed rail, which is to say, if high-speed rail is gonna come on the peninsula, they need to pay for passing tracks. That is what Caltrain has said. So it seems to me, um, we can go with what uh, Larry and others are saying, which is to only have a two-track discussion, but you might have an asterisk column that says, if we have to have four tracks, then we'd like to reorder our alternatives because if, if high-speed rail is, is paying the majority of these tracks, in other words, if Palo Alto has to accept four tracks, then does Palo Alto want to look at a trench first instead of looking at a hybrid or a viaduct? If we're not picking up the cost, does that change your order when you're looking at four tracks? I, I, Caltrain might say that, that that high-speed rail pays for the construction, but I'm not sure we get a free four-track trench if high-speed rail comes. And I know that Larry will tell us he doesn't think high-speed rail will ever come. <laughs> um, and I don't know whether I think it'll ever come either. Um, whether but I if you want to be on record story. to be able to help with negotiations, Larry, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll aim this at you. If you think that if you think it's never going to happen, but you want to take a negotiating position, is it better for us to negotiate a position that says, Okay, if in the future we have to have four tracks, in our, these are our order of choices for four tracks, or these are our pros and cons for four tracks versus the two tracks. 
getting into lot, hypothetical upon hypothetical. This is two levels of hypotheticals, which makes it difficult uh, to make a decision. Uh, you also, uh, 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 that's a nice assumption that uh, if we had all the money in the world, would we prefer the trench to something else? Uh, probably, um, but uh, uh, I don't know whether the, I guess I don't have any problem putting in that sentence, but I would really bury it somewhere because I don't think it adds to our credibility at all. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the challenge is any of the two track designs that we pick have to have the ability to expand to four tracks. That's basically, Caltrain has made it clear that that's what, that, that the, design, the only designs they will approve will do that. So for example, my concern on the viaduct is that the design that we've been shown I'm not sure allows you to accommodate for four tracks because of the way it swings the position, right? One of our engineering people say that you can always expand things if you're willing to, to, to spend enough money on it. Right, but Caltrain's gonna try to make, they're not gonna approve a design that makes it in, extra expensive for us, right? That, that, that's, that's an assumption. You don't know that now. But yeah, also so, the thing we do oh, know yeah. is that the, the viaduct right now does not baseline uh, shoe flies. And if you went to four tracks, you would have to shoe fly. Yeah. Why? Keith, what was, uh, Phil, what was that? Okay, let, let me just say this. Phil, your mic, guess. put your mic near your phone, your uh, mouth. Whether the viaduct could certainly be converted from a two track to a four track operation by reversing the direction of travel of one of the two track structures originally constructed. Uh, and I really, by the way, I really support Larry's point about hypotheticals, but in the realm of things hypothetical, assuming that the four track doesn't cost us, then the real issue is, first of all, can Caltrain physically build a four track structure? That's an issue. Not around Churchill, they can't. Well, not without taking people's houses, they can't, which they probably won't do. And second, uh, what is the differential impact for example, light planes or noise. That to me is how we, we might look at it. Also, I'd like to add that it's not clear that when we pick just two track alternatives that uh, the particular two track alternative will present a real challenge in being expanded to four tracks. And so rather than try to crack our heads now, why don't we first rank things based on two track designs and then circle back and say, do we have any special four track considerations? Otherwise we're caught in this rabbit hole. Okay. And as Larry said, hypothetical and hypothetical. And so, you know, dinner's waiting for me at six o'clock. Oh, well, you got time yet. <laughs> I know, but just pointing out that we're finishing at six tonight. Thank you, yes, we are. Carrie, you were gonna say something? Um, we have no data at all to make any kind of recommendations on four track alternatives. That's correct. So it would be strange for us to try to do so. Furthermore, um, I don't know if council's criteria include four track or not. Um, what I'm reading here doesn't say one way or the other how many tracks. Not likely. These are from September 2017 where this was yeah. in a discussion. Yeah. So if um, to the point about cost, if we wanted to break out item K, which is order of magnitude cost into overall cost and cost to Palo Alto, we could do that. If you're thinking that we'll have un other funding sources that would change how we look at that, we could do that. Um, is that something that people want to see now or is that only relevant for the four track discussion? I don't have any thoughts on that. I mean, it sounds like there's more people who want to just discuss the two track option and put a big asterisk in the front of this thing, which if that's what folks want to do, um, uh, then so be it. I mean, I, to me, it goes against what we've just been given from Caltrain, but, uh, but if I'm in the minority, I'm in the minority and that's okay. Well, well, what, what, can, what can be done about it really is the question. So is this something that you would need to take back to council and ask for updated guidance on what this body should do. Sure, we could do that. But I think we could, I mean, we could certainly also, I, I just have a problem with, 
I, well, for me personally, I don't think we have a lot of information. I think the underpass has been underdeveloped. Um, and so I have trouble deciding because I feel like there's more work that, that I would like to see on that one. That's where I am on that one. So are you mm -hmm. thinking about potentially doing a, a sanity check about if we're ready to make a recommendation on this set of crossings? Yeah, I mean, I guess I want to hear where everybody, because in my mind, I'm only ready to rank these as far as which alternatives I think need more work, not that it's my preference. I don't know where and everybody else is. I, I agree with Nadia. I think this ha the underpass has the most potential. I think it can be refined. There are many opportunities to refine it. I think members of the community, Penny uh, Ellison uh, has done an alternative. Her husband has done a different version of it. They're both really beautiful. And so I think there's a lot of potential here and I think we need to study it further. Just as I thought the mitigations on the church closure needs to be studied further. But I, I don't think we should abandon that one. I, I can't see at this stage of design how you abandon something that has that potential or even others, other op options. There's a lot to learn from each one of these. And at this stage of design, it's a learning time from all options and then coming up with something that's better for Palo Alto than having to choose between something that's uh, not good for Palo Alto and asking us to pay for it. That that's that that nut is really going to be difficult to 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 convince someone. At least, if I someone asked me, I, I want you to pay for this thing that makes Palo Alto worse. I'm going to say no way. So, I think we need to look at these options more carefully. I think especially the underpass has a lot of potential, and I think we need to look at it a little bit further. Is there anybody else who feels like or who wants to speak about what they're feeling? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of hope that we get to talking about how we feel about all the alternatives because we actually haven't done that for six months. Okay. And we're most of the way through our second meeting for our deliberations and we haven't actually <laughs> talked about what we all think we should do next. And okay, well, so Greg, when you want to do I'll, that. I'll let you go for it. Go for it. Lead us off. Um. I have a very, very hard time accepting an alternative that means taking of homes and apartment buildings, unless it is significantly better than the alternatives in ways that make a real difference. To me, it really feels like the underpass option is trading off visual impact and traffic congestion in one part of town and moving it to another part of town, just like some people complained about with Churchill. And it has property impacts and it isn't really significantly cheaper than the viaduct, and it's not any quieter than any of the options. So to me, it's a very creative solution, and possibly with a whole lot more work, it could be a better solution. But I guess I have to ask the folks who have looked more carefully at the angles and the grades and the, the widths, is there a version of it that doesn't have as many property takings? Because if there isn't, I'm going to have a very, very hard time supporting that. And I'm going to have a very, very hard time supporting the trench because it still is a lot more expensive. So that leads me to where I've been for nine months, which is, is it a hybrid or a viaduct? Okay. That's, I mean, unfortunately, I haven't seen anything that's really changed my mind on that same conversation. So the so. things I'm hearing you say to make the, to, hear more about the underpass is uh, reduce eminent domain. Yeah. And uh, you say a little bit more about the moving traffic. I didn't quite well, understand. Well, I know that. that, for instance, in the traffic analysis, um, there are now cars moving through the Fair Meadow neighborhood um, in a cut through movement that weren't previously there um, because it is uh, now not all the turning movements are supported. So I think in the traffic analysis, we have traffic, traffic impacts on neighborhoods that aren't Alma and Charleston, which are our, our, our major, which are major commuting routes. Um, right. we've, 
And then, so anyway, so, you know, just the whole grab bag of things, but I'm trying to make this about concrete things that I can understand and not about sort of, you know, emotions and some of the things that I've been hearing. So, sorry to jump in here, um, Greg, can you scroll down to the purple section? Yeah. Um, so one of the things that is, is fun about this matrix is that we can pull pieces, parts together and be yeah. able to have the discussion um, yeah. on a different slice of data. So one thing we've done here is we have a, a section in here for just this purpose to talk about how it affects the people that live near the tracks. And just to remind everybody, these, these light green numbers on the left, FO1, FO3, GO1, those are ones that I think uh, they are represented above, and those are the ones I think reflect the concerns of people who live near the tracks. So this could help us kind of pull those things together and, and understand better if we've, if we've captured that. I do see we have some issues uh, with the underpass that are highlighted and different issues yeah. with the others. So if we do want to stick on this topic and, and kind of hash it out, yeah. that would be great. And I would love to be able to reflect it here so we can kind of all be on the same page. Well, I think this segment is a very interesting one because you see the dichotomy that I've been struggling with, which is between the acquisition of private property in uh, F01 and I03, railroad will not be visible. Certainly the public comments are running about 10 to one, uh, arguing that railroad will not be visible is kind of the most important consideration in this whole process. And I wanna remind everybody that F01 acquisition of private property. And we're not talking about small acquisitions of private property either. We're talking about acquiring entire homes and businesses. In addition, you know, there is visual impact to the underpass. There are, there are walls where there didn't used to be walls. There are wider roads where there didn't used to be wider roads. It's not like the train is going to disappear and so are the cars. So all of these options have visual impacts. Even the trench has a visual impact in the form of a fence that, according to Pat Lowe, has to be at least eight feet tall, if not taller. Um, but to me, I think this is a great way to really look at that trade-off between how does it look and what does it do for people who live near the proposed construction? So with that, I'll end my yeah, little question. Thank so, you. Right, this, this gets hyper-local. Yeah, You're one of the people whose property is taken completely, not just a sliver, mm -hmm. or if you live next to somebody's property is taken, or even if your property is not taken, but you your property abuts the traffic circle, you're going to have a very different value matrix than people who live three blocks away, who may be mainly concerned about traffic. Uh, this is a harsh trade-off. And to be honest, what you just said really... It stirs me up in ways I wish I didn't have to be stirred up. Because but I think that, that we need to be sure to advocate for all these people. We're hearing very yes. strong advocacy for the, I don't want to see the train. Which argues for the trench, which is yeah. kind of emotional what I would do until I think about the dollars involved. And I can't separate any of these alternatives from the dollars because if dollars were not an issue at all, we'd be off of the tunnel. Well, we've already agreed the tunnel is too expensive. I did want to make the point that we shouldn't use the word take because there's acquisitions and there's actually a significant number of people who have shown, who at least from what I've heard, are, are actually interested in the potential benefits they could have. So I just want to be sensitive to the language. It's a hard enough issue. And by saying take, I think it, it stirs yeah, up all right. well, more not, emotion. Do we have any hard data from the actual people whose properties would be acquired by eminent domain indicating that they would willingly go along with this or oppose this because with that data which probably could be assembled pretty quickly and rip, rip on i guess i'm looking at you here uh, that would clarify this moral dilemma and this is a moral dilemma am i going to sacrifice some of my near neighbors or not i think part of this is it has to be a discussion between the city and until the city hears what what recommendations there are 
difficult for oh. them to begin a conversation, right? Yeah, I, I can just tell you that we have received some concern from people that have properties that are in the areas that look like they might have property um, impacts. Um, so we have received concern, but that's not to say that there are not people within those areas, as Nadia said, that would, you know, like to have their, um, you know, a negotiation for their properties. Um, so, but, but we don't know, do we? I, I can only tell you what I've heard. Um, but yeah, as Nadia said, we wouldn't start those discussions at this time. Not but, even a preliminary query to the extent of we are considering what is so, your initial idea? Not even that. That's no, not we appropriate. Would, we wouldn't do that. That wouldn't be appropriate. But we oh. have we have um, you know notified properties, and we've got we've received concern from you know from people that were notified or from people that saw um, their property included in the impact section. Yeah. So let me ask you a slightly different question: When do we get the town hall feedback, which might shed some light on this issue? Soon. We were hoping to have that this week. I'm sure it's coming very soon. Hopefully by next week. And when that does come, will it be in a form that we can download it or otherwise read it? Comprehensive? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And, so, and, and to, and to, oh, go ahead, Greg. And I think that I hate to be cruel about this, but there is a consideration because Larry made a point early on when the council said there will be no impact on property. I think Larry argued that wasn't fair because it might be the case that some impact on private property is worth the trade off. The current design for this underpass seems to have impact on a reasonable number. I don't know the exact number, but a reasonable number of properties. It's not just one property or part of a driveway. To me, that's really the sticking point. And what I what I don't know is that if you know we extended X cap for another two years, and if we do, please don't make it every week, um, <laughs> and did more work on the underpass. Um, would it would that number come down to something that we all feel like we think the trade off is worth the visual impact for me that's going to have to be a really, really, really low number. Um, because I am sensitive to visual impact, but I'm also sensitive to all the other things we're talking about so. Um, I guess I don't know how to ask that question, I mean. Yeah, what does I more work on the on the underpass mean does it mean better paths for bicycles or does it mean like hey we envision some new way to do this. Well, we, we could, me, sorry, uh, we could theoretically say we really like the, we're really intrigued by the underpass option, but um, we'd like to see further iteration on design to, and that's why I was trying to get you to be specific, reduce eminent domain, reduce cut through traffic, whatever kind of all those things. To me, eminent domain is by far the most important part yep. of that particular. The cut through traffic is concerning, the weird bicycle paths are concerning, but I think there's probably things we can do. Right. And if it had no property impact at all, I might be jumping up and down for the underpass. Um, right. And there's a trade off with the bike width versus the property impacts. I mean, there's a lot of things that 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 are squishy there. And so we could say, you know, we could theoretically say, well, look, we really are intrigued with this alternative and we think it needs more work and then decide on the other three. And by the way, that's why I was also suggesting, for instance, hybrid at Meadow underpass at Charleston because the property impacts it. Which we can't, we can't do. Yeah. I thought, well, I thought, I thought we, we could do hybrid. No, remember they came back and explained to us that they the, the, the up and okay. down wouldn't make it. Okay. okay. Yeah. Sorry. It's okay. Um, Nadia, I, think, I, I think that there's a combination between hybrid and, sorry, Carrie, did it's you okay. want to go? I, I want to respond to Phil before we get yeah. too far yeah. off track. Would that be okay? I'm sorry. Yes, please. Yeah, no, okay. the good. So Phil, one of the questions you asked is, is how are we getting feedback if we're not doing surveys? And I think that the, the, the way that this group was formed addresses that. We brought in people from different neighborhoods and different perspectives. I understand that we've, we've lost some members and, and that is an issue, but I think that's, that's sort of our function is to, to represent some points of view and, and bring perspectives and uh, especially you know, have empathy through our discussions with the community. So, I'm hopeful that we have captured at least some, it's certainly not as much as and as detailed as a survey would do, but I, I hope we have incorporated some community perspectives and feedback and the impact. Empathetic. Yes, and we have had through public comment, we've certainly had empathy um, brought to us by the nature of the public comment and all the emails. True, true. And also just to point this out, we don't just have a lives near the tracks. We also have a all Palo Alto residents and we can adjust if that's not the right buckets. 
um, we can have, you know, different buckets here. So if, if you guys, as we go through this discussion, think, you know, I need a little bit more granularity there, that's something we can adjust. But it'd be nice to be able to roll it up and be able to compare and say, okay, so for the ones that live near the tracks, here's the, the, how the options prioritize. For the ones who are in a different location, here's yeah. the options. Then we can see them side by side and see sure. who, who gets the shortest yeah. distance. Carrie, just one technical note on GO2. Mm -hmm. You talk about electric engines. It's electric rail, self-propelled electric rail cars as opposed to diesel oh. engines. I, I just copied the text. Uh, I know that, but that. I, so I thought- we I update that? that? What? Well, maybe not now, but it should be fixed because it's just a technical issue. What what would we want to say there? G O two. G O two be electric self self propelled electric rail cars. <laughs> okay. Is anyone object to that? You could just say electric trains. <laughs> I think that might be sufficient. <laughs> okay. But yeah, yeah. Electric train. Well, actually, it's funny, but that actually affected our noise estimate. The fact yeah. that the motors were at the bottom it's rather an, than it's at the actually, top of the train an, actually had an impact on the noise on the noise estimate. Isn't it EMU, Phil? Wouldn't the term EMU, be? Yeah, yeah, electric yeah, EMUs. Yeah, yeah. That's that's what's yeah. so propelled. Yeah. So, so EMU. Multiple. Yeah, Sorry. that's the same thing right. in different words. Utilizing so. EMU trains instead yeah. of diesel. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and actually, yeah. I, I I wanted I may suggest I may suggest a paragraph that I might add tomorrow if I get time to your chapter, Phil, I would love, I, I tried to add safety as one of the reasons why we need grade separations. I think also train horn noise might be considered a reason okay. for grade separation. No, I, I know that. The reason I wrote what I did, Greg, was to capture the motivations as they were articulated, not as right. to all the other- Guys, I'll let you take that benefits. one offline okay. so we can stay we'll, on carry working through this matrix. We'll do that via email, sorry. Um, I think Tony was on stack. Yeah, yeah. I have yeah. A thing to add or clarify. Um, I think Greg asked if we could mix and match a, a hybrid and underpass option between the yeah. two. Yes, we provided that response previously. And we, yeah, it could be done, but it would need some additional analysis and design. Oh, it can be done. It can be done. Hybrid and underpass. Yes. That so changes. I'm in, sorry, Carrie. Go ahead, Tony. I'm, I'm going to go. So, yeah. um, my view is like Ripon said, there is an option to do a hybrid and the underpass to combine those two. And, and my view like Greg's is that if there are property acquisitions or property uh, yeah, acquisitions, it must reach good uh, for me to go with it. Now, having said that, I think there is a, a uh, uneasiness about Caltrain saying that they don't want a uh, shoe fly track in order to build a, a push box. Um, and that complication makes me a little worried. And I think we should not assume that the push box is an important aspect of this design. Yeah, and we I haven't. Think, yeah. And so I think the hybrid combination with the underpass has a lot of potential. And um, I think we should explore it. I think the, we have to raise the tracks a little bit in order to get bikes and peds um, with a soft, with a flatter uh, grade. And so I think that's the combination that will work well. But, but that's the kind of engineering that I could imagine more work would, would fix. Whereas eliminating all of the property impacts that sounds like a totally different design. So that's why also Meadow has fewer turning movements in the underpass design than it would. And actually some of the traffic impacts would also be mitigated. So I think there's a lot of reasons. So also. Phil, um, I mean, uh, Greg, are you saying you would, so where would you prefer a hybrid and where would you prefer an underpass? Hybrid at Meadow, underpass at Charleston. Okay. And the reason why is, I mean, I'm, I don't have the plans in front of me, but at Meadow, um, actually I do what I got to find them, um, in my 20 browser tabs, there's that apartment building at Meadow. That's a lot of property impacts in a yeah. town where we have a housing problem. So one thing I, I, th I wanted to see if we could capture somewhere, Carrie, and I don't know what the right spot is. And I, I realize Carrie has to go in about five minutes because um, uh, she has PTC, but is that um, one possibility that was raised also uh, 
I believe when we were talking with the land use attorney, is that the city could acquire, for example, they could, they could acquire the, the uh, apartment complex, build whatever they needed to build, and then redevelop that property. In other words, so, there, so you may have a temporary loss of, how, of, of the housing stock, but you could put it back and potentially put back more depending on what the council, future council decided on. And I think that that's an important thing when we talk about uh, property acquisitions or property impacts, because um, you always have the, you have the potential to be able to, you know, alleviate the problem for the, for the current resident, but still be able to modify the property and sell it back um, and still, and not have it be an entire um, acquisition that cuts the housing. And I think that that's something that could be explored. So Nadia, I just wanted to clarify that I meant when, when I was talking about it, I didn't mean Meadow gets a hybrid and Charleston gets an underpass. I, I meant that the hybrid and the underpass can be combined for a new uh, high, high underpass, I mean a hybrid underpass. So I, what I don't yeah, understand one, one about that, oh. yeah, Sorry. I think, key, uh, and maybe Keith, you were going to speak to this. I think the problem becomes that the key feature of the underpass is that the bikes and the peds are in their own tunnel. And in order to maintain the movements that the hybrid has, um, that when you go down lower, they intersect in that plane, right underground. And so you can't, you can't have a, a mesh of those two. Yeah, there, there is, a, there are a couple of conflicts. That's yeah. True. So, but you, so the bikes and peds won't be in a, so, I mean, I think the, the differentiating factor of the underpass is of course the bikes and the peds are completely separated from Alma. You cannot mesh the hybrid and the underpass in such a way because you basically run into the now undergrounded bike and ped piece. That's correct. Yes. So, so those two can't be meshed. Keith, were you going to say something? Yeah. To me, that's the killer app for the underpass is that you're separating, you have so many school kids, so many junior high school kids that are going back and forth. They're separated from traffic and they don't have to wait at the light. Yeah. So, I mean, any, I mean, when I look at the trench, if you had the trench and if the trench had that capability, it'd be a slam dunk. That's the only thing that's missing out of the trench is that separate um, bike vehicle um, lanes. Um, so in the interest of time, I think we should probably put a pin in the discussions, but I did want to say um, for our next meeting, we will basically prioritize having each XCAP member go around and basically free talk about how they're feeling at this moment in terms of the alternatives to get to what Greg is saying. Like we haven't really had a check-in in six months. And so that let's do that at the beginning of the next meeting so that we don't lose our way. Um, and again, we can continue to use the matrix as, as ideas come in to, to fill in a bit more, but that way we can hear from everybody. Carrie, were you going to say something? Just say, sounds good. And see y'all next time. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thanks, Mike. Good night. Ciao. Ciao.